Thank you all so much. Um, I'm really humbled to be here uh, to deliver this lecture in honor of Professor Cable, um, whom I met yesterday and found out that we have uh, a lot more than poetry in common. We both have Texas roots. Um, in fact, the place where he did the famous dance, The Broken Spoke, is um, part of my, fa my white family I've never met, um, but my great-great-grandfather was the mayor of Austin. Um, so it's always interesting for me to be back here. I went over by Tillotson College and over on Salina, not too far from campus, but you know, the house that I know my grandmother lived in where her white father visited when he from, went away from his white, from his white family um, was, was torn down. So, um, but it's still very good to be here. So we have a love of Texas roots, he's a local Texan, and also a love of dancing. So it's really genuinely an honor. I think I have to give you a curtsy. And I want to invite you to come up and do a tap dance with me. Go. Yeah, you're not gonna do it? I can't tap very well. You know, I've got like, not very well. Okay, we'll do it. We'll save it for later at the Broken Spoke. All right, so um, I really appreciate all your generative work in the history of English and on prosody. Um, my thank yous this evening will not be as eloquent as those of the Catalan poet, is it pa Pasaricias? Parcerisias that um, Cyrus read yesterday at the uh, um, plaza. Nevertheless, I want to acknowledge the Office of the President, the Vice Provost, the Department of English, um, and all of those who supported the phenomenal work that goes on here at Tilts. Um, again, thanks to Lisa Moore and Meta Jones. I think they deserve a standing ovation um, for their amazing work. Thank you so much, really. We're, we're at the theater, so. Um, I also want to thank Cassandra and uh, Malia, who helped me make our lovely installation, which I'll be talking about here on precarity. I want to thank uh, Joanne Flores and Julia Delacroix um, and our videographer as well. They've all been inst inst indispensable. Um, also, given my topic, I think it would be remiss if I didn't mention those in the travel industry, taxi drivers, airline staff, hotel workers. <laughs> Um, everyone and all of us who must contend with our precarious world. To Marilyn Hacker, all respect. The world is a far richer place with you in it and your work. With this symposium, uh, we have in some sense critiqued uh, Audre Lorde's idea about the efficacy of whether or not the master's tools can dismantle the master's house. However, I think all of us in the room could agree that poetry is not a luxury. One of her other axioms. <laughs> And it is in this, with this phrase in mind that I offered my statement of the world is a richer place with you in it um, in the previous tribute. So uh, it's clear that the poetic community here at UT Austin, as Gabriel Mistral's poem Prayer, translated by Langston Hughes, says, is bursting with miracles, as is the spring. So my plan this evening, to the extent that I have one, um, is to go through several performances of precarity and to paraphrase Toni Morrison, take refuge in the how, if not the why of their form. As this lecture on, is a, on poetics, I will be mentioning line breaks and free ber verse, metrical feet and enjambment, but they might be of the more literal sort. Enjambment. <laughs> feet. Um, I begin with a syllable and uh, indeed just a single letter, then go on to a diagram and an event, and if we have time, um, a symphonic crescendo, not of my own making. So there will be a line, it is not straight, um, about translation, mostly between media across time and space. As was the case yesterday when we heard the last 50 lines of the Octavio Paz poem that had begun hundreds of lines earlier, we too begin in medias res with the letter P. I have a penchant for the letter P and its prosodic and orthographic, which, as Professor Jones reminds us, are very much related, with its prosodic and orthographic properties. This enchantment with the letter P plays out not only in the title of this lecture, The Poetics of Precarity, but echoes in the pause in the fragment of Sappho's poem, in the kingdom of intertwined pronouns of pause, the word perfidious, as written by Anna Seward, Alexis's pithy pro prophetics, Yeats's paraphrase, and thanks to Chad, I can now say poet instead of queer by Frank O'Hara, 
and of course in the wonderful performalist poetics, poetics given to us by Yorawan, the letter P. There are props over there, but I'll just use my body as a prop for this part. Per son a vacation. Section two, precarious movement. It has three epigraphs. To look only at bodies and objects is to miss the movement. Brian Masumi, Parables of the Virtual. It is better to live in a state of impermanence than in one of finality. Gaston Bachelard um, from The Poetics of Space. And as a rejoinder to those ideas, and since in the tradition of this conference, um, this year-long celebration of poetry, I felt I too must read a poem. Um, so I'm now echoing back to Harriet Mullen, who was here in the first half, and reading her wonderful poem, Mantra for a Classless Society, or Mr. Roger's Neighborhood. Cozy, comfortable, homey, home-like, sheltered, protected, private, concealed, covered, snug, content, relaxed, restful, sedate, untroubled, complacent, placid, serene, calm, undisturbed, wealthy, affluent, prosperous, substantial, acceptable, satisfied, satisfactory, adequate, uncomfortable, uneasy, restless, Unsuitable, indigent, bothersome, irritating, painful, troublesome, discomforting, disturbing, destitute, impoverished, needy, penniless, penurious, poor, poverty-stricken, embarrassing, upsetting, awkward, ill at ease, nervous, self-conscious, tense. Precarity. It is not a pretty word. It has been called a bad anglicization of the French precarité or the Italian precario, whom protesters at the University of Milan made into a saint, San Precario, um, and who's, whom is often imaged as an African immigré. Nevertheless, the term's ugly feeling in the mouth bespeaks its meaning. It verges on being onomatopoetic as it drops precipitously off the tongue. On the page, it positively tilts when it's written with a capital P. And you might notice what, when I was doing this, the P is a bit, a bit unbalanced, you know, sort of tilts. And where did precarity begin? As with any narrative, the origin is arbitrary and takes place repeatedly and retroactively. Some might begin with the 2004 publication of Judith Butler's critique, Precarious Life, Mourning and Violence, which was written in response to 9-11. Uh, and I think that the term precarity, in fact, has been in heavy rotation uh, since then on the channels or scholarly channels, let's say. Um, in Precarious Life, Butler commented on the extent to which the mode of invisible censorship serves as, quote, the line that circumscribes not only what is speakable, but also what is livable, unquote. Here she is working along with ideas comparable to those by Agamben and Bear's concept of Bear's life and, and Spivak's idea of the subaltern. The reason why people, certain people's voices cannot be heard, certain people's images cannot be shown, and certain people's lives cannot be grieved publicly in post-9-11 America is in large part due to operations of racism um, as well as, of course, religious uh, uh, affiliation. Yeah. So um, if I had a sort of method to this, I would love to um, try to do this talk in terms of what Marilyn Hacker described of Adrian Rich's snapshots of a daughter-in-law by writing that the work was strengthened by a shadowed present of the sonnet sequence in the shape and structure of many of the sections in the way many of the strongest lines swell or retract to, to the pentameter, but also and especially by an aptness for nonlinear progression, for intellectual jump cutting, for building an argument and a narrative with a cinematic accretion of images, personae, and ideas made coherent by the numbered breaks in the poem, rather than a linear narrative or stanzaic progression. Several demonstrate a distant, distinct volta, the lines following with change in direction, sometimes surprisingly, and respond or comment to the section in the opening. Each section is self-contained and yet reflects on all the others. The order seems gratuitous, but is in fact inexorable. Um, but I'll save that description actually for the main work of the, that I'll talk with you about today, which is a piece by um, Al Allison Smith, um, which kind of resembles this piece here. So I'm going to actually follow Jeffy, who is the character um, in The Daily Family Circus. 
And Jeffy's perforated meanderings will guide us tonight along a circuitous journey through several contemporary poetic responses to the concept of precarity. Um, before I move from this short description then of my methodology, I want to point out that this comic appeared in 2004, the same year as Butler's Precarious Life, um, which may be serendipity, but if you could see uh, carefully, the comic curmudgeon's blog noted that this was the first return of the line in many years, and uh, this is what the curmudgeon had to say. Hey, the dotted lines are back. That's great. It gives you something to latch onto in this panel in which nothing else seems to have meaning or purpose. You see, Jeffy goes around the clown because, well, he doesn't want a free coupon, I guess. And he's sweating because clowns are scary. And when, when's the last time you saw a clown in full getup handing out free co coupons? Usually they are passed out only by board college students, homeless people. And that's written with a slash, board college students slash homeless, student, homeless persons. Um, unless there's a big to-do or something. This commentary, um, while it might seem funny, right, does acknowledge the very fact of the precarious world in which we live, where that solidus or slash, that tenuous term between college students and homeless people, between us and quote unquote, now I'm not saying this then, but, but that connection, right, is both something that sutures and separates. Um, and so this is part of what the thematic of thinking about where is the line, right, between which, a below a poverty line, a below a sense of what they have in Europe, which is more an understanding of dignity as opposed to human rights, right? That that dignity is actually a human right in certain canons of law, but not our own, right? Dignity is not a word that appears um, in our constitution. So that the comic here uh, recognizes the unstable workforce world which we inhabit. Um, and I'm walking a tight rope here, I know that, but I want to take stock of the situation. Section three, taking stock. Okay, so what you see here is um, photographs from a 1968 demonstration by an artist named Yaoyoi Kusama, still living in Japan. Um, she lived in the US in the late 50s, early 60s, and was really one of the first performance artists and was in the same kind of group with um, Oldenburg and a lot of uh, the downtown artists um, who were protesting against the, the Vietnam War. So what you see on the screen um, is a kind of split image, actually, of uh, her protest, which was a naked demonstration at Wall, Wall Street, which took place in 1968, and where she said that stock is fraud. It appears to be a simple sentence, stock is fraud. Its symmetry belies its ethical charge of asymmetric relations between rich investors, stockholders, and a growing community of workers who exist on the mar margins of the market. The charge stock is fraud first was uttered by performance artist Yayo Kusama in conjunction with her 1968 protest performance, a happening known also as the anatomic explosion, which was a naked demonstration in front of the stock exchange. The performance piece began as a call by Kusama and her dance troupe to pro protest unchecked wealth by going to Wall Street and occupying the space whose investments in the stock market were financing the Vietnam War and contributing to income disparity. The happening was part of a larger event in which Kusama and her colleagues sought to obliterate Wall Street men with polka dots. Um, Kusama's troupe of dancers stripped down and tagged various bankers in a gesture similar to the recent spate of glitter bombs unleashed by anti-homophobic activists. The group of de demonstrators chanted, stock is fraud, stock means nothing to the working man, stock is a lot of capitalist bull. We want to stop this game, the money made with the stock is enabling the war to continue. The event encapsulates an entire theory of false futures inherent in unchecked capitalism and recalls, if not prefigures, the recent resurgence of the concept of precarity, to which much recent work um, all across the globe, but also at the American Anthropological Society, American Studies Association, several special issues of art and research, and an upcoming one on the Drama Review, have all been devoted. Before the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999, which was passed originally in 1933 and related to the 1929 stock exchange, uh, first, the first stock market crash, um, it was thought, it, what it did was to separate out, um, and made a hard line between investment and commercial banks. But that act was repealed, and uh, now we've had a second market crash by, um, you know, in 2008. So I'm just sort of putting this Kusama's work of protest um, because I'm going to be talking about the Occupy movement right into a much larger line of um, uh, protest, particularly using performance. 
The term precarity has been associated with the May Day events in Europe, Italy, um, uh, and el especially, and also and happening since 2005, and now our annual events. Many of these explicitly evoke the feminization of poverty that the nonprofit organizations Queers for Economic Justice sought to alleviate. Um, precarity, as the editors of a journal explain, is life lived in relation to a future that cannot be propped securely upon the past. Precarity undoes a linear streamline of temporal progression and challenges progress and development narratives on all levels. Precarity has become a byword for the life under late capitalism, or for some, capitalism as usual. Precarity can be understood and added to an arsenal then of movements dedicated to reversing the exponential growth of the so-called 1%. Is it perhaps this latest incarnation of the neoliberalism that is the condition of our living and the underlay capitalism? And yet, there's no doubt that the movement is right on time. Understood as a global um, situation, precarity places a broad spectrum of workers into a wobbly realm of uncertainty, unmoored from the promise, always already and yet again elusive, of security and sustainability. Precarity presages the end of a Fordist economy and the unrestricted growth of liberal subjects in both senses of the term. Everyone today, it seems, is invested in the stock and trade of the stockbroker, whether broke or not. We all witness this phenomenon as a result, and many across the globe in parks, plazas, and squares have responded with radical embodied actions aimed at combating what must be understood as life lived on the tightrope, about which more later. And recall that as my through line. Such anti-lifelines stretch before us and require a virtually impossible balancing act. Thus does precarity underline the shifted imbalances of balances as a banking counts which no one seems accountable. From the inspiring tumult of the Arab Spring and its tangentially related Occupy movement, the uprooting that precarity has engendered may indeed um, be a route for the collaborative collection, collective actions like those performed by Kusama and her troop of demonstrators. Um, it is also available in Alison Smith's work made in 2011. Um, so Alison Smith's 2011 stockpile. Um, Alison Smith is a contemporary artist who moved from the East Coast to Oakland, California. She is known as someone who is part of a larger craft movement that, like the primates of tilts, seeks to reform questions of form. Smith's work and those of her co levels allows us to return to handmade artifacts and reinvest in notions, material, ideological, aesthetic, and political, that do, um, that do not seem uh, to be, sorry, that do not see them as simply antiquated or quaint. Um, so the movement to the artisanal calling of young hipsters to urban uh, new capitalists was mentioned in this past Sunday's New York Times, or actually we had a discussion today at lunch about what is it with this move right towards um, uh, people making their own things, uh, going back, uh, having organic gardens, having fantasies. I think we talked about it, having a goat farm or goats in the house even and making cheese, right? Okay. So that concept that seems uh, to be everywhere in our contemporary culture um, is, is in some sense part of what Smith as a conceptual artist is invested in. Um, although, of course, in her case, she's not trying to um, have a business. She is um, a, you know, a nonprofit in the most traditional sense of the word, although I would have to say I've profited, and I hope you will too, from engagement with her work. Certainly, Smith usually makes her work by hand, but also collectively. She is, like many of the contemporary artists, um, someone who devises and curates as well as composes. Her attention to assemblage ushers in new ways of thinking and acting improvisationally. And I think we can draw a line here between Joanna Dr Drucker's discussion last year of um, authorless art and some of what we discussed today in terms of those edited collections where the author's name is um, sort of not, appears in, in very small letters at the bottom of the page, um, or uh, even in terms of what Drucker had called um, uh, conceptualism's unoriginality, right? So not a concern with, with sort of the author's mark or with um, a, original sense, but, but new con this, this conceptualism's unoriginality. So I agree with Drucker that we seem to be in the midst of a flowering of collective art production typified by the redo, um, by echoing call and response deployed by the Occupy movement with its human mic checks, which I think is just a really brilliant move in terms of um, that question of the human and technology, uh, or also with viral memes, which I'll be talking about a little later in the talk. So stockpile that you see before you. It is at once a sculpture and an event, as well as a simulacrum that fraudulently represents the past through its use of recently manufactured colonial props and a false future inherent in its unstable structure. 
To speak of this work as an example of a poetical performance of poet precarity is to replace it in terms of time and space and the movement between the two. Specifically, Smith's work makes use of temporal distortions that bend, if not rupture, unilinear narratives of time, what many scholars have referred to as queer time. The installation is a concocted, cancankerous collection of fraudulent colonial era items piled precariously as if awaiting or warding off a coming hazard. Is the pile from the attic, the cellar, a cellar on a street? Would we know it? Uh, sorry, while we know what is meant to evoke, perhaps, by its um, shape of its, uh, the items that are there, we could, I think, also, in our own eyes and imaginations, see this as a scene from Exodustra, Kansas, the Trail of Tears, Nazi Germany, World War II LA en route to the Japanese internment camp Heart Mountain, or day three in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. The aptly named Smith makes material culture the site of insights about larger politics of precarity. Her assemblage mo mobilizes materials such that they are what they do. In sharing this work with you, I want to focus on how Smith materializes these mobile structures of feelings and goods that comprise our global situation. Her performances, in general, usually tend to participate in what she calls wars of detention. Um, and of course, de detention is a term from Latin meaning to hold back. We can see how Smith returns to reenact her obsession with detention, a place of punishment, correction, holding, or delaying here with this stockpile. In other words, um, this can be seen as part of a place for exercising the militarized prison industrial complex. Smith's multimedia work weaves past and present art and politics together. Her uncanny, belated, and yet on-time performances further engagement with warcraft, unrepressed traumas, and items from a buried life whose resurrection enacts sensations in the now that must also be associated with then. In short, her work often performs the contradictory, temporarily elastic phrase, was, is, coined by Stein and carried forth by Faulkner. Smith's stockpile comments on economies of colonialism, past and present. The word stockpile itself connotes military meanings, particularly the idea that the objects have been commandeered or even mustered. The labor and effort involved in moving materials is both present and represented in this work. It is, as Ellen Diamond says, a doing and a thing done. It is Americana manufactured abroad, democracy made elsewhere, a mixing. While we may remember Wigstock and other parodies, Smith's work is more hard-hitting than those, I think, although it is actually also parodic. It obliquely cr critiques the troubled notion of racial stock, referenced here in the title and also in the bleached wooden objects. Right, so I've been calling them kind of colonial, but you see they don't have the patina of age on them. They're not dark wood. And she did that purposely because she was trying to evoke this idea from Toni Morrison of, well, she wasn't, but I mean, we had a discussion and we were talking about uh, this idea of the, the, the sort of uncoloredness of these um, uh, items, right? So that lest they could be part of a kind of nostalgia or museumification, um, that here she's, she's deliberately leaving them um, in their unbleached state. Uh, to sort of recall this idea um, of a manufactured whiteness that is belated. Um, indeed, the piece brilliantly references a multiplicity of related things and agenda, all borne by the very invocation of the term stockpile. For example, we can connect pigs and pr paper that are composed of stock at the same time that both are traded as fungible assets. Stock's fraudulent properties do not prevent it from being affecting our very lives, and so too with this seemingly inert work of art. We are, all of us, intimately and seemingly irrevocably bound up with piles of stock, yours, mine, and every little living thing we know. I want to say more here about the unstayed wood objects, which actually were made, uh, in, uh, you know, they're sort of produced in, in, in um, manufactured in places like India, China, and other global sites that retain um, a new trace of imperialism. These quotidian ice, um, objects, desks, and you know, she's critiquing things like writing in the West or port authorities, tables, um, which also speak about culture, commerce, and law, or chairs, right, seats of signing and civilization, armoires full of cotton, wool, silk, and various excess material, all appear to be in a liminal state, neither actually stockpiled in an armory nor unpacked and placed in a home. Rather, they float precariously in the center of a museum, itself the product of revenue generated by the 14% hotel tax um, in San Francisco, which was meant to fund the arts, right? So we're back again to that politics of travel, um, which again, we are all participants in. 
All of these things stockpile before us trade on our willingness to view them in a human context. They seem to be essential even as they are superfluous. Moreover, their time is unstable and their location and found, as is their foundation and location. Smith's stockpile teeters temporally on an invisible line between then and now. Yet her work is somewhat prescient, um, and she helps us to rethink this fact that the new global phenomenon around precarity has in fact been ongoing or might be part of um, an historic, uh, certainly, ideas of liberalism and, and idealism in America. For everyone now is on the tightrope, not just the previously unstable citizens sans papier or sex workers, but also the stagnant middle class that can no longer claim, lay claim to a mythic proverbial good life. It is no accident that Smith's studio and workshop is located in Oakland, which has been the epicenter for police brutality long before the recent resurgence of violence in conjunction with other reactions to the Occupy movement. Oakland is also where one of the Occupy's most successful protests took place. The collective action resulted in the shutting down of the port of Oakland, which is where all of these items you're looking at actually were ordered and came through. Um, and is among the nation's busiest. And for several hours on a gray November day, thousands joined voice, forces, thousands of us joined forces as we walked the freeways, culture jamming the major arteries and disrupting the flow of goods. Significantly, this same port saw the importation um, of these images, uh, sorry, of these pieces. I'm gonna give you another view here to look at. So the day I visited Smith in her Oakland studio, in front, um, her front windows displayed um, an old shop where she works and featured these sort of theatrical gray curtains, right? So think about that too in the trajectory that it used to be a shop in the 19th century but now is a place for art making. Um, one of the windows showed miniature versions of several pieces of furniture that you're looking at here. Um, they were then scaled up to make stockpile, right? So first she sort of carved her own versions and then she had them made uh, in places like Vietnam and abroad. Okay, so Smith has used the strategy before to equally good effect in performances such as her jackass, donkey, and mule, which was, you can imagine from the title was also about questions of race, um, which was modeled on 19th century pull toys. This work immediately brings to mind manufacturing as well as economies of scale. Making macro issues out of these micro works not only solicits human engagement, but also changes our relations as well. We become both giants and children with agency before them. We, have we stumbled upon a Victorian playroom or onto a set of Duck Gulliver's travels? Smith's decidedly upscale sculpture when fully grown and placed in the confines of the museum as it was in Yerba Buena right before um, this past summer, right before Occupy Wall Street was called, went out on uh, September 17th. Viewers became aware of the fact that when the doll's house things became a giant stockpile is when the nightmare commences. As such, they are reminiscent of the holiday tree in a Christmas pantomime familiarized by annual productions of the Nutcracker Ballet. Stockpile shows Smith reenacting making and generating political rather than naively nostalgic effects. The items that appear before you in this unfinished state uh, ask us also to invest our own ideas about them in, in terms of a blank slate. Although one could imagine Phyllis Wheatley and her writing implement working at the desk stockpiled in the piece, or perhaps Afro-native Afro Crispus Attucks, the first person to die in the Revolutionary War for freedom of this country, wielding one of the wooden muskets, my sense is that stockpile is aimed at what Smith has called a paranoid subject. Knowing too well that the artisanal and handmade crafted uh, movement, which I mentioned earlier, that the practice and skill involved there is not inherently radical. And I think Marilyn Hacker made this point yesterday in her address when she was saying to be able to be a wonderful craftsperson of form um, is not necessarily to bespeak politics, right? That goes all the way back to the beginning of the address of, in fact, sometimes something radical can be made with the master's tool or something um, conservative by you know, some sorts of political measures, right, could appear in a radical form. Yeah. So Smith, too, um, in trying to not be classed as part of someone who's part of this kind of back to the um, uh, roots idea of like, or, or, or sort of a tea party aesthetic, if you will, um, is, is trying to use forms of exaggeration, parody, or camp to critique these claims on the past. She is interested in misquoting, recombining, and revising, and asking who's past? Who has passed, P-A-S-S-E-D? What passes as radical chic? We can't imagine Smith's paranoid person stockpiling supplies, squirreling them away lest, lest they be destroyed in a coming race war. Again, Schneid, Rebecca Schneider writes about Smith's obsession uh, with provoking a kind of call to arms by saying, whose war and when? Right? 
So I think that all of these critics and this piece is in addressed in trying to make us think about our own implication in terms of history, location, um, and the claims on the past as well as um, the present. One must think then about Smith's work and how it incorporates the other in accordance with such ethics, aesthetics, and politics. How does this work work in an age of occupation? How does it stand as a testament to precarity? The majority of the moving parts of the assemblage were made, as I've said, in China, Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines, and India, and then were glued together once they arrived at the Oakland port by Smith herself. The supplies are staged to resemble a futuristic frigate, actually, a kind of anachronistic battleship that can transmit and receive images for the future. And here I'm thinking um, about uh, Alexis Gums's wonderful work, Alexis Pauline Gums' work, where she's concerned very much with how um, do we have a legacy of questions of the future and also with technology. So here I'm going to sort of shift and point out some other things that might not be uh, immediately visible in this concatenation of uh, pieces. So um, in fact, she talks about, there's a, I don't know if you can see it, there's um, a, at one point like a little slate that's there and she talks about that as an iPad and in her studio she has on an old 19th century writing desk is where her computer is, is stationed, right? So it's this sort of palimpsestic idea that we are still using the past and she's trying to be um, kind of sly about thinking about this as a spaceship, right? And she was saying she was thinking about that table at the top as a kind of satellite beam. Um, so, right, this is another way she's trying to at least make us, con as a conceptual artist, think about the time of this piece, right? Where does it belong and how is it functioning? I think there's also a way in which this piece is trying to critique the founding and foundation of the West um, uh, because the fact that now we have exported democracy across the globe, right? So that the, the um, she's mimicking economic uh, uh, traffic, right, by having the pieces made abroad and then now, you know, brought back to the U.S. But she's also, I think, trying to critique how the democracy and capitalism are twin forces recolonizing the third world. The very models of the past have been outsourced. We are left to ask who owns, who owes, what is our debt to these precarious arrangements? I also think it's significant that unlike much of her other work that conscripts people and volunteers, um, she's doing a piece actually this weekend in San Francisco where she wants people to come and crochet um, sort of emblems for the Civil War, um, but then do other things with them, um, that this stockpile refuses to incorporate performance directly. Rather, it indexes human labor indirectly, making it even more of a replica of capitalist forces, where in the new empire, we pay people to guard buildings as a form of disaffected labor. Presently, the very future of stockpile, which is now dismantled, you can't see it anywhere else except on these pictures, um, is precarious. The total effect of stockpile highlights precarious global movements at every turn. It should be understood as a political act of the kind that Hirschhorn in his text, Doing Art Politically, what does this mean, that's the title of his piece, centers on is this question of form. To understand the question of form, he writes, as the most important question for an artist. Ultimately, the aesthetic and political autonomy of the artist is always already engaged in confrontation and exchange with the other, unquote. I'm only interested, he says, in what is really political, the political that implicates, where do I stand? Where does the other stand? What do I want? What does the other want? Stockpile concerns itself, like Bachelard, with resolutely domestic, intimate things, the cupboard, chairs, tables, objects that nevertheless incite dreams and nightmares. We could remember, too, that Bachelard's uh, sense of effective space were constructed out of his connections with Ravel as well as Rilke. Like Brechtian actors, the pieces of wood that comprise stockpile break from mimetic realism since they present themselves as alienated by virtue of the very fact that they appear in their unfinished pre-patina and stand stained state which is an ethical and political choice as much as an aesthetic one. The work demands that we take one's time in circling around what registers as concaphony, even if it is silent. The cordon off work that appeared in the museum prefigures the confiscation of materials that took place after it was dismantled of library books, tents, tables, and blankets taken from the Occupy camps scattered across America. The term stockpile possesses the ability, as do all nouns in English, to be both a noun and a verb. In Smith's practice, this stockpile was already manipulated by the artist's hand, and yet never at less calls out for more interactive human touch. 
before I totally leave my reading of this piece, I'm just going to give you a quick sense of a list of what was there that will give you um, this understanding of what I was talking about with how it indexes the human even without actually um, including uh, you know, humans in it. So it's a chest of drawers, three small benches, a folding cot, a drop leaf table, a postmaster's desk, a rocking chair, a 10 gallon keg, coffin lid, a rope, quilt, five wooden candlesticks, a pleather, a pleather flume, flume, sorry, a feather plume, an ax, a slingshot, a clay pot, crochet pouches, a small easel, easel one teapot stamped no stamp act, and a small redware pitcher, and an apron, um, among many other things. And if you can't see it from here, and I wasn't able to get the detail, but she actually has handwritten the word empire on some of the ends of tables and around. So this is where I'm getting part of my critique of how this is, in fact, um, something that is critiquing empire. So this li the list reads like findings from an archaeological dig. Included are many fundamental elements of everyday existence needed for life. Eating, drinking, writing, sleeping, reading, praying, cooking, and shooting. The found objects bespeak human culture. There are no iron shackles here, however, no whips, no bleeding flesh, in fact, nothing dark at all. And yet the pile reeks of human civilization, which is to say barbarism, to paraphrase Walter Benjamin in reverse. The latter crafted works harken back to Smith's signature style. Um, she describes this, sometimes her work as like a quilting bee, but the end result is something nightmarish. An accompanying brochure for the piece had this to say about it. One way to decode a society is to create an inventory of its material, culture, and tools of everyday life. Within this list of things, one can construct a variety of narratives about social history in place. Through a series of moves, Smith inverts and valorizes those well-worn images, crates, barrels, canteens, and flags, by transporting their use value from functional object to fuel for a large campfire or funeral pyre." Unquote. Among the sculptural em emblems of patriotism, I have included, she writes, such familiar forms as these crates and barrels, but I see them as part of a paranoid person's um, obsession with things. And perhaps they are objects from the home or from the battlefield that are collected like a pile of loot in reserve for some time of shortage, emergency, or paucity. The assemblage, as Smith reads it, suggests a giant collection of technology, of history, of the future, of paranoid trauma, and perhaps these recombinant gestures signify her ethical investment in eschewing this nostalgia that can accompany some invocations of the past. Smith's sculpture incorporates key words from the movement, such as empire, as I've mentioned earlier, also concept metaphors such as support, lean, rest, balance, verticality, above, below, and most forcefully, precarity itself. Section four, and I'm almost done. The tightrope between performance and precarity. Remember I said I would come back to the tightrope. You see the accretion of images, stick with me. Um, this is yet another picture of precarity. It is a female presenting dancer known as ballerina balancing on a bull. There's our alliteration for the day. Significantly, it is uh, the image that accompanied a hashtag called Occupy Wall Street, um, right? When the call went out to Occupy Wall Street on September 17th, it then became a meme that was created um, in the Adbusters office in Vancouver, where uh, uh, the Occupy Wall Street, in some sense, might have been conceived with this call, with this twi tweet. tweet. Um, the poster of the dancer balancing on the iconic Wall Street bull became an early call to join the demonstration. Um, she is in, I have to do this part over here. An arabesque, which in English is also known as an attitude. I kind of like attitude a little better. <laughs> so um, this poster, uh, was, uh, well, it's not actually a poster, it's a digital image, but um, it, we are, what are we to make of her awkward balancing atop a raging beast? I didn't attempt that, although I know we're in Texas and we're at the home of the bulls. <laughs> Believe me, I thought about it. 
Um, it surely seems part of the larger visual economy of work on gender, where events such as the Euro May Day parade seem to fill a gap between theoretical work on the feminization of, and of effective Im immaterial labor. So too, the meme suggests that the visual icons seem to have been at least as successful as text messages in publicizing precarity discourse. In her work on kinesthetic empathies, dance scholar Susan Foster looks at the work of Monsieur Chevalier de Jacor, who had an entry in the 18th century on of Diderot's dictionary or encyclopedia on dance. And Chevalier was a tightrope dancer. And just as a point of interest, um, the dancer here is wearing a leotard. And if any of you were curious, you probably didn't wear a leotard, I don't think, Professor Cable. You have? <laughs> Okay, well, when we were back in uh, late 18th century France with um, a tightrope walker named Lyotard who came up with the uniform, right, that wouldn't get caught on various kinds of things. Okay, everything is originating in France today. So, Jacquard proposes that the tightrope dancer's performance offers viewers an unusual sense of identification with the dancing body because of its treacherous and suspenseful relationship to gravity and potential hazards that may befall it. She writes uh, Mrs. Foster's words, observing the dancer's precarious positioning, Jacquard argues the viewer experiences the stirring up of emotion that instinctively arises when we, when we see those of our, like ourselves in peril. We had an interesting discussion today about identity and identification, yeah? Um, this surge of emotion is based in a reading of, of the scene in which the dancer is enmeshed, the relative height of the rope, any sharp objects that protrude beneath it, and the length of the passage from one end of, to the other. Similarly, Eugenio Barbo posits that precarious balance is an ingredient in all interesting performance, noting how a body leaning into space, almost to the point of falling, arrests the attention of the viewer. Such bodies keep the eye moving through the manipulations of balanced industry and precariousness being a prime example of this spectator to pay attention in case you're falling asleep. Another A, this time A. Smith, Adam Smith, and this. Um, was in a piece that Foster did, cites an economist and, and theorist of empathy, empathy, clarifies further the interpretation of public spectacle by reminding observers that they can never know directly another's joy or pain. In her reading of Smith's The Moral Economy, Foster says that Smith insists that observers project themselves onto the role of the person they're observing, and therefore, as an act of imagination, take on that person's feelings, right? So this is kind of to juxtapose, and I'm just gonna jump down. Uh, juxtapose, right, looking at objects and then looking at people. And I want to just do one more thing here and then I'm going to close. I don't have time here to analyze the amazing work by the videographer and the choreography which um, Janelle Monet does herself. But I just want to say in closing that to walk the line, to be on the tightrope, is to be an ethical dilemma, to have to deal cautiously with a precarious situation, often one involving a choice or a compromise. This lecture has taken us on a vertiginous route that has danced on the broken line, if not in the break, drawn and redrawn between precarity, poetics, and performance. In so doing, it has tried to enliven the gestural pose that is the building block not only of sculpture, but also of the so-called time-based arts of theater, dance, and film. In my sculpture class, we once threw a mass of clay on a table and then read its gesture. Mine landed on the far edge of the table. It felt as if its gesture was lurching, tentative, precarious, like life, liberty, and happiness. Thank you.